Huggy, thanks for coming back on for this final part of our interview. Yeah, yeah it's good to be back. And I, I changed shirts. I, did, I, I was going to go with the same green shirt and make everybody think it was one big, gigantic interview we had done. But I, I thought in, uh, since you, you let the, get the cat out of the bag at the beginning of the interview uh, on, uh, with, on when you released episode one, about coming back to the U2, I thought I'd go ahead and wear my, my first reconnaissance shirt. That's the old that's the old school, the first Aero Squadron, or, or the first reconnaissance squadron goes back to the days of the first Aero Squadron. That was the first flying uh, squadron in North America. Uh, Blackjack Pershing back uh, chasing uh, uh, the Mexican bandit Pancho Villa, uh, you know, mm-hmm. 1913, 1912 or so, 1913, I believe. So we are the lineage of, uh, of that squadron. And uh, so we keep that lineage and uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a, Kind of cool, 105, 106 years. Of course, I think uh, I had a, I had a different Brit tell me that uh, we had we had we had flying squadrons in the UK before you before you had the first. So uh, we argued about that, and they said, "Yeah, we are flying balloons." I said, "Balloons don't count, <laughs> Come on, really." But uh, <laughs> no dirigibles. They're fair game. They uh, they yeah. count. <laughs> <laughs> dirigibles. <laughs> so so speaking of uh, of um, uh, stats, then uh, of numbers. Uh, I have made the mistake of attributing uh, you as being the highest hours uh, U2 pilot. And, and it's completely my fault. I should make it clear to my, my listeners and viewers that uh, at no point has Huggy ever said it or even suggested it. It was actually somebody who, who knows you well told me that. And I, my, you know, I'm an ex-journalist, so I should have known to check. Um, or maybe I shouldn't because journalism nowadays seems to be uh, to say whatever you want anyway. It doesn't matter if it's not true. Well, I got an earful, believe me. I got, <laughs> my friends call up, hey, I got more hours than you. So, <laughs> so it's actually... Uh, Active duty wise, uh, when I got out, there was only maybe I think two guys, two pilots that actually got more hours than me on the active duty. Since then, two more guys have surpassed my hours on active duty. Uh, very very recently, both of them. So and then when you so I think that put me number five at least, if not I'm missing, maybe missing one or two folks on the active duty hours, uh, not by much. Uh, and then you've got the folks that went over after they retired, they went over to Lockheed to fly down to Palmdale or they went to NASA uh, down in Southern California and uh, flew for NASA. A couple of the guys have been doing that for quite a long time. And I, one of the, uh, one of the guys out there retired with 5,500 hours, uh, a lot of time flying the ER2 and, and, and uh, flying with Lockheed. There's one of the guys I got to, tr- I'm trying to track him down. He's from uh, many, many years ago. Um, Ron Williams is his name. I think I got a lead on him last night. There's a rumor he has over 6,000 hours in the YouTube, but he was back in the old C model day. So I'm going to, I found out he's in the Vegas area. I'm gonna try the number after after this interview. I just got it. I'll give him a call and see if that's true. But uh, there's a few. But uh, uh, you know, the other thing I joke with the folks that fly at NASA and the folks that fly at Palmdale is they're all flying these nine, ten hour test sorties. Uh, I'll tell them, you know, you, you guys got five thousand hours flying the aircraft, but you've only flown it a hundred times. You know, because you're flying these long duration missions. I got a, I'm flying one point five two hours at a time with students who are trying to kill me, and I'm only racking my hours up so many times. You know, it, it's uh, it's a good joke. I have almost. Um, what, 20, a little over 2,500 hours, but about 900 sorties, 900 flights in the YouTube is what it boils down to for me. Do you know how many of those are operational? How many of them are actual, you know, go out and do the uh, job? I would, uh, I don't know. I, I, I really don't even know. Um, you know, my first, my first three and a half years when I was at Elkenbury, uh, all, most I could go back and look at those. There was, uh, you know, we were flying, I was flying operation, a couple operational sorties a month, I would guess. Uh, plus when we were deployed, maybe a few more. I, I don't know, a couple hundred of those sorties? It's hard to say, but, you know, when you're flying the training sorties, you know, you, you rack up the hours really slow, but you do rack up the sortie count very quick. Nobody tracks sorties. Everybody tracks hours, and hours is the easiest way to, to measure a pilot's experience level and the least accurate. But, uh, but it's, it is still something. You know, you'll see on the solo patch, I don't know, I think the, we're wearing on the left sleeve this year. Uh, but you'll see some of the pilot, pilots will put their – Every 500 hours, they'll put 500 or 1,000 or 2,500 or whatever. You'll see it on their patch and letting people know how many, how many hours they got. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fun little, um, you know, a little, little bragging point. You know, a lot, a lot of us like, like to wear out, you know, wear around how many hours. But ultimately, it's, good. it's just good for showing off in the bar amongst each other. Nobody cares. So speaking of which, then, um, yeah, I think I said in the intro in the, the first interview um, that you had some idea you were going to go back to the program when we were talking in – you know, you'd said don't say anything because you don't know if it will happen. Um, are you able to describe or discuss more now about where you're at with your? Um, you know, it's been it's been on the it's been on Facebook that you soloed again. Um, what yeah. can you tell us? Yeah, yeah. So uh, during the interview process, uh, or when you and I were talking, 
the uh, they they put the proposal out to to hire uh, they they taken two military slots that were in the first reconnaissance squadron, and they converted them over to civilian uh, civilian slots, not contractor, actually government employee civilian slots, and uh, the way they decided to do it was take one of the make one of the slots full time, and take the second slot and cut it in half and make it two part time. Uh, folks that were going to be two pilots that were going to be job sharing the the, uh, the position, and so <clears throat> that was the one that I ultimately applied for. Uh, the other two pilots that that applied and got the job, uh, Corey, uh, he's 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 I think I don't think anybody's got more active duty hours than he did. He got over, just over three thousand right before he retired. He retired the exact same day from the Air Force that I did, and he uh, he started up at Beale about two weeks after I did. But he's the full time guy. He lives in the local area. Uh, he had been working for NASA for four years. Uh, post post airline, he uh, post Air Force. He'd done a little bit at one of the airlines. Uh, wasn't for him. He took a job at NASA doing all the cool stuff they do down there, and then uh, the opportunity to come back into the local area. He took that, uh, and then the uh, the second guy, uh, Dean, a very very close friend of mine, uh, fantastic flyer, and just an amazing background from B fifty twos to KC KC tens to the U two, then to the F one seventeen. Uh, then they, as the uh, deputy of uh, deputy chief pilot at the Armstrong uh, Flight Research Center down at Palmdale, Edwards and Palmdale, uh, so he's uh, he's going to stay on part time at NASA. He's going to he's going to work the job up here too, and uh, uh, just uh, it, it's it's really the other two are just fantastic uh, choices by the Air Force to come back and do this job. And and they're you know Corey's super high time. Dean's got uh, again a, a vast array of experience plus you know fifteen hundred hours or so in the U two and was an instructor and. Uh, so it's it's gonna be a lot of fun. We got a lot of good experience, but uh, applied for the job. We did a, a Zoom interview with the squadron commander and the the DO and the chief of recruiting. And uh, the uh, a few weeks later, you know, we were notified. Hey, we uh, we got the position. So uh, I cranked uh, I cranked up on uh, June eighth, and it was right back out there. And uh, they 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 they've created a fairly fairly fast syllabus for me to go through. Uh, Corey and Dean had. State current flying the ER two at NASA, different cockpit, different different graphics, and they still want them to come back and fly the new cockpit. I shouldn't say graphics, avionics. They're going to give them a few rides, but uh, with me being out of the cockpit for six years, they gave me a, a still a fairly accelerated uh, ride, uh, uh, accelerated program. And uh, you know, right through the academics, uh, I'll segue on that is I teach the, the academics, the ground school. I'm one of the backup instructors as a in a different role that I have. So it was very, very easy to spin up on the academics and, uh, and get that done. So uh, went through that, all the egress training, ejection seat training, the, uh, the, uh, all, the, all the physiological stuff for hypoxia, all that. We, we pounded that out really, really quick. And uh, before I knew it, I was in the, in the jet flying, and, uh, I used, as you saw on Facebook. So three or four quick flights, a dual, and uh, then into my check ride, which was just on, uh, when was it? That was uh, Wednesday. So I am fully qualified as a U2 pilot. They, uh, I shouldn't say that. They, they accelerated the program so much. I haven't been up in the, in the pressure suit yet. I haven't flown day and night. So my qualification says can, cannot fly high, cannot, can only fly during the day. And what they're going to do is my next flights are going to be in the back seat doing my instructor uh, upgrade. And we'll get the high flight and the, the day and night on that. But um, it was it was a lot of fun. Everybody's come back and said, uh, "Hey, it's is it just like riding a bike?" And I said, "Yeah, it's come back really, really quick." I said, "But if Schwinn built bicycles like this, we'd have we'd have killed ten thousand, you know, t tens of thousands of cyclists." And uh, that came readily apparent to me on a recent ride. I mean, I'd had every one of my landings from the first one back. It just it felt hey, I felt like it had been last week, and uh, just we were having a great time doing the engine out patterns and the no flaps. And I had a uh, I had a landing really recently, and. Uh, it was probably my worst U2 landing in over well over 20 years. And it, it just came out of nowhere. The plane will, it's just a quirky airplane. It'll just come up and new things, things are going great and it will come up and bite you. And uh, man, I, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was varsity maneuvers for me to get, to get the, get the plane back, uh, uh, back where it should have been. But it was just, wow, how does this happen like this? And, uh, very, very embarrassing for me. I take a lot of pride in how I fly the aircraft and, uh, and to have that happen was uh, was certainly it was a, it was a good uh, it was a good good way to get me humbled and remind me hey don't don't take this for for granted which I don't but it, it was it was a good smack upside of the head it was a uh, it really got my attention. Can, can you say what happened? Yeah, we were uh, we were uh, we were, uh, well we were just doing a normal pattern. It was actually the full stop landing, and uh, the left wing had gotten a little bit heavy, 
and uh, tried to balance it on that. And we had some, there was some, I noticed early on on the flight, there were some aerodynamic differences on it, on the, uh, on the aircraft. And we do most of our fuel balance, not with aileron trim, uh, but we do it with balancing the fuel because most of the time we're flying slow. And if you've got a heavy left wing or heavy right wing, it is uh, generally due to the fuel weight in the wing, not the aerodynamics. But we were doing some high speed stuff early on and it, there, it was way off. So I was, I was trying to get the feel for exactly where we were on the trim on the aircraft. And as a reminder, on the U-2 fuel, when they put the fuel in, they, they've, got, they've got a main center tank, but they've got uh, two tanks, an outer tank, and an inner tank on each wing. And they fill it up, and they let you know how much fuel is in, in there. And fuel can move around left and right a little bit. And additionally, they add up all the quantity of the fuel they have, and they put it on a, on a fuel counter. So there's no, there's no sensing. Like every other aircraft you've ever flown, which has sensors in there to tell you how much fuel is in there, you don't know how much fuel you have. You assume they put in that what they say they did, and they added it up correctly, and they put the right number on the counter. So really, we say the only time you know how much fuel you have is is when the uh, when you take off and when the engine flames out. Uh, everything in between is kind of a guess, uh, but it's pretty close. But the the tough part is when the fuel moves left to right. You do a lot of left turns and you'll get a heavy left wing, and you, you ha- it's it's a it's an art. You learn how to just to feel the aircraft and how much fuel to move. I knew the plane was getting a little bit heavy, so I started moving fuel, and we talked about it, and uh, yeah, maybe a little aerodynamics, but it was no big deal. We'd just done a couple landings. And we had a pretty good stiff crosswind, right quarter in crosswind. And I came in, and I, 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 was, I was right on speed, which had I been two or three knots fast, actually probably would have worked out a little bit better for me. And I think it's the combination of uh, uh, the quarter in crosswind, the left wing got, uh, got blanked out a little bit, a little bit of the heavy, wing, uh, heavy left wing, and just, you know, just ultimately my fault, it, the left wing just suddenly stopped flying and dropped off. Similar but different to the scenario I gave back uh, when I was flying at Alkenberg on that no flap. And uh, when it came down, it, it came down and yawed hard left, and uh, it was it was kind of Mr. Toad's wild ride for a couple of seconds, getting it back on the center line. And you know, nothing nothing was hurt, nothing was damaged. I didn't think I was going off the runway, but it man, it uh, it really was a it really was a wake up call. I'm guilty of not having done my research. I didn't know there was a uh, a weapon school for the for the uh, YouTube. What does just that- happened. Okay, just happened. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty neat. And uh, I actually do a, a little newsletter. For uh, for the YouTube community, and I I've done eight of them, and I just wrote down my, well, the one I released on August first. Of course, the the first uh, yeah, the 65th anniversary of the first flight of the U two, so released it that day. I had a, had a talk about that, but a lot of people for many many years have been doing things to lead up to the weapons school, and there's been a big fight. Uh, and I'm not privy to what what are the things that happen behind the scenes, but finally, just in the last few years, they we're gonna, they said that we're going to integrate the the U two into the weapons school, and they chose three of our uh, three of our uh, uh, just top aviators, uh, very, very smart guys, and they PCS them. They, they, they permanently sent them to Nellis to go build the course, you know, when Nellis is where the weapons school is. And uh, those three uh, folks worked with the, the weapons school cadre, the weapons school intel folks, um, and, you know, which, which is all a very, very high level of uh, um, military knowledge out there, as you would guess. And they created this entire course. And then once they built the course, then they had to be the students to go through the course and get critiqued on it. So they did that, and they uh, and they, then they went through the course, and then they graduated uh, just just this past December as the first weapons school graduates. Since then, after they graduated in December, we sent the next two pilots to the course, uh, and they graduated June, uh, I guess late June. They just came back to us, and they're going to be the first two pilots to come back, one to the 99th and one to the first, to be our in-house weapons school experts. And we now have two more pilots out there going through the course right now, and they're doing some – they're doing some great stuff. Uh, uh, one of the things they told us about—they don't tell us everything they're doing—but they're do, they were doing some uh, multi-ship engagements with uh, with Mirages and uh, stuff with F-16s and, uh, and 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 some of the stuff. You know, I I, I I don't know what level some of the things they they told us are, are, so I won't go into them. But it's really fascinating stuff, and they are really taking uh, the YouTube program to the next level. And it's happening. It's happening very fast. It's something that should have happened years ago. In many cases, you know. For many, many years, 15 years or so, I'd say we've languished because of the the uncertainty of the funding of the U2 and so many people that were trying to take the money and, uh, and you know, is the U2 going to be around? Well, we're going to be around now. And now that we've invested in the weapons school, you're going to see some big changes, I think, in the, in the U2 capabilities over the next uh, over the next three years. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. So, we yeah, we have our patches. We've got our, our, our patch guys in the squad, in both squadrons, and they're going to be doing great work. Um, I've actually so what we'll we'll do on this interview is is we'll do an AMA at the end uh, and I have a handful of questions, not too many. Yeah. Um, but but uh, 
you know, there are some questions that pertain to to the future of the aeroplane. So I won't go into that now. But if it's okay, I can I'll pick up with that. Uh, I'll yeah, pick sure. up with you on that at the end. Um, yeah. So so going back then to you being back in the program part time. Um, what's the uh, objective then behind using you as a sort of the direct employee of the the DoD, but as a civilian nonetheless, and replacing a, a military position in, in that sense? Well, they have they have quotas for elderly people. They have to let us uh, do this thing. I saw a comment on uh, one of the websites out there. Somebody wrote in and said, that's really cool to have him do this at his advanced age. I'm like, advanced age? Are you kidding me? They're crying out loud. And the picture they put, I mean, you, could, you couldn't have put a worse picture on there. It looks like I'm about 80 years old, you know, coming down, waiting to get, out of the, get off the ladder, get into my wheelchair, and be pushed back into the squadron. They're crying out loud. But, uh, <laughs> you know... There, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of U two talent. I live I'm, I live 40 minutes from the base, and there's a lot of U two talent in the area. And when I retired in 2014, it wasn't optional. I had come up against the end of my my time in service, and the way the rules are and such, it was like you got to go, get out. And uh, it was it was a good time for me to leave. But uh, you know, I've got I've got a lot of desire to come back and do it, and a lot of experience, and especially on something like in the in the schoolhouse. Where you've, you've you've got good pilots, but they need to go through do the career development. They've got to, and they're going to go off to the detachments and be commanders and ops officers. They're going to go to the weapons school and they're going to they're going to do all this. And so you're then training up a new guy or gal and get them getting up to speed as an instructor on the aircraft. Well, now with Corey Dean and I, we're going to be parked there for a few years. We've already got tons of experience, and our hope is that we can at least on the very very basic level. We're not going to be flying classified missions. Um, but on the very basic level, we can come in there and be pure instructors, people that want to instruct. We, I love instructing. I really like being a flight instructor, um, and just sit down and, and show and talk and explain the things we've seen. And, you know, for example, you know, here I am with this is one of the worst landings of my entire YouTube career and ha- it happened in the last week. And for me to be able to sit down and talk to them about, Hey, here's the, here's the environmental that you're going to see. Nothing, you know, nothing in the book about this, but let me tell you what's, you know, what, what you could potentially see. And a lot of that pertains to things that happen up high and in the suit. So I think it's a, it's a win-win for, for very, very little cost, you know, actually less cost than bringing an active duty person on. The Air Force is able to bring back some really, really, some folks, they've, they've literally spent, you know, millions of bucks of us uh, on training us to fly the U-2. And they're getting the, they're getting the payback on that uh, in, in spades. So I, I think it's a win-win for everybody. We're happy to be there. Uh, and I think that we have a lot we can we can give back to the program. How many two seaters do you have? We have four. The uh, originally so interesting story. Um, a few weeks ago, when I try, I've been spending the last couple of years trying to track down a lot of the alumni, and as you know, originally they didn't build any two seaters. Well, I tracked one of the one of the older guys from the 1960s down, and when they're flying him a Davis month, and he was going through the training program, had some really bad landings. They said, you know, you. You're, you're, you need to improve it. So they gave him another flight and ended up crashing the aircraft. I mean, like the wheels came off, skidding down the runway. He got out okay, but that accident made them go, hey, we need to get a two-seater. So they, they, they took his aircraft, sent it back, and they rebuilt it as the first two-seater, what we call the CT, or the two-seat C model. It may have been the one that sat at Alconbury and is now hanging in the 8th Air Force Museum at uh, Duxford, by the way. Oh, uh, which, okay. It was at Alconbury. It was a battle damage tree. They beat it up. It was a two-seater, and, and then – a uh, lucky guy named Bill Bonnix and, and just a great, great guy. He got a team of folks at Alconbury and they, they converted it back to the single seater so they could hang it up in the eighth air force museum there at, uh, at Duxford. So if that's the one I'm thinking it is, that was, that was actually a two seater at one point. That may be the one we're talking about. Okay. But when uh, his, his, uh, his, his act, his mishap really probably down the road saved a lot of people because it made them realize we've got to have a two seater to get this aircraft safely, people to train safely in it. So when they reopened the production line uh, in the 80s, the, the second and third aircraft off the line, 6-4 and 6-5, they were created as uh, U-2RTs, the T being designation for the two-seater, and then uh, 1091, which is the one I had the really <laughs> horrifying landing in the other day. Uh, that was, uh, was that the, it's, it was near the end of the production run, but that was actually designated as a TR-1B. That uh, was paid for by a different pot of money. And so they had three original two seaters. Excuse me, they had three original two seaters. And uh, when seven eight was uh, had a landing mishap at Alconbury in April of 1990, it was taken away to Palmdale, sat there for a few years, and then it was rebuilt uh, as a two seater. In fact, when they 
went to the S model. It was it was one of the first three S models. So it was converted from a single seater to a two seater. So now uh, here we are, 1995, up to four four jets. And then in the early, late 1990s, they pulled 1068 off the line and converted it to a to a two seater. So then then they had five. 1068 is the one that was uh, that was lost in the mishap four years ago. So we're back down to four uh, two seaters, three original, and then seven A, which was the one converted. Going off on a tangent, it's notable that you really know your history on the aeroplane. And I, and I recall from the first interview, which was you know some time ago now, but, I, but it sticks in my mind that you said, you know, Chris Pocock, the aviation writer, yeah. you know, he, he might be cringing at some of the, the figures yeah. you were coming out with. <laughs> but, but it does sound like you really know your history. I'm curious to know whether or not that's a characteristic of the U2 community. Because um, I know that there are other uh, flying communities where people really don't care about the aeroplane in, in that sense. You know, they want to know how it works. They want to be able to employ it. Um, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a war machine, but they don't really care when it first flew or how many there are or what variants there were. Are you, are you uh, alone in the U2 community in that respect? Uh, I think there's a higher level of interest in the community than you'll find other places, other, other, other uh, communities on the history of the aircraft. Um, in fact, when I came back starting, I think this last Friday was my fourth time doing it. I do a, we're all on a on uh, the, the app Slack. We're on there. So we do all our communication with the squadron now because of COVID. It kind of drove us onto Slack. And I have a, every Friday now, I do a U2 history and trivia, uh, for, a Friday U2 history and trivia. So I've done four or five of those. And, and you know, t- t- I've been doing up some, just like actually the one I did um, this yesterday was uh, on the aircraft 1099. Uh, a very unusual history. The last U2 produced, delivered to the Air Force in October of 89. But um, it was damaged. It's coming back. But but as, uh, I, I'd say I'm, I'm a bit more of a geek than most of the folks are as far as the history goes. Uh, there's, and there's a varying level of interest. But I'd say there's, a, there's generally a pretty, pretty strong interest in, in the history. And judging from the feedback I'm getting on my, my weekly Slack history and uh, the Trivian history article that I'm putting out, people are really enjoying it. And, uh, you know, I, and they, I get asked a lot of questions about it. So I'd, I'd say, yeah, there's, I, I think I, ha- I have a pretty good knowledge uh, and, and maybe some of the best knowledge in the squadron. Chris Pocock is certainly certainly the worldwide expert on that, but uh, I've got a pretty good knowledge of the history, and uh, uh, I, I really I, I do it because I enjoy it. That's it. Just um, b- before we move to the AMA, then um, just a little bit about you. Then, so you you are now back in the, the program. You're doing that part time. You have referenced being an airline pilot as well, but also you fly for is it the Patriots? They're a, a, an aerobatic display team or you did uh, what, what other uh, interests do you have yeah patriot jet demonstration team i'm uh we fly a six ship of l39s it's based on the west coast uh some maybe civilian uh, there's a blue angels thunderbirds we actually had a snowbird on there he's moved on uh i am we fly six aircraft with six pilots i'm the seventh guy i sit in the back of the aircraft as a safety observer usually as usually the number one aircraft but i'm the team safety officer we lost this entire season um I'm also uh, doing air show. I am an air show announcer. I've been doing that for about 10 years. How, and, how, does, uh, how, does, how does that work then? I mean, it's, I, I understand you, you, you take a microphone and, and talk while the display is going on. But uh, again, is it uh, something you have to sit down and spend a lot of time doing? Or you go and interview people beforehand? What's the involvement? Early on, again, I guess it kind of goes back to that. I'm a bit of a bit of an aviation history geek, uh, if you will. And I, I enjoy reading about, uh, you know, the different, the different aircraft, the different performers. So early on when I kind of got into this, and, and let me back up, the way I got into this was, was my neighbor, was my ops officer. He was also an aerobatic performer, and he put together a little a little air show at the local airport with a, actually a couple of big-name performers. And he said, hey, you seem to know, you always know a bunch of aviation weird stuff, and you like to yap on them. You know, you, you probably have fun yap on a microphone. Would you come out to our air show and announce it? I'm like, sure, why not? So I went out there and you know, I don't know, it's a couple thousand people, it's small, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And one of the performers, John Culver, came up afterwards, and he's been on the circuit now for probably 40 years. His wife came up and go, hey, we're, that was really, really good. We appreciate what you did. Hey, uh, how, long, how long have you been doing this? My first show. And uh, he said, oh, you got to get in the industry. We need, a, we need good announcers. Uh, not me. So a year later, same thing happened. He came back. He said, hey, you got to do this. And not interested. Well, he called me a couple weeks later, and long story short is, he helped get me into uh, the El Centro Air Show in 2009, I believe it was. Uh, it was that's the Blue Angels season opener. And the, the announcer they had there for years and years and years had a conflict and couldn't make it. And I called up and I, I said, hey, my name's John Huggins, and I want to come announce your air show. 
uh, who are you? Yeah. Oh, we've got, we've got somebody else. No, no, he's going to be in a conflict, but I want to come to your show. Well, what's your background? Well, I've done two volunteer shows. Click, you know. So uh, a bunch of the performers in the West Coast knew me, and they said, oh, and they knew me because I was when I was a military guy. I'd rather just take off with the military guys. I would usually peel off and go hang out with the civilian performers and just, you know, kind of starstruck with some of these military with the civilian performers. Really, really fun folks, and I, I, I befriended a lot of them. And they, a couple of them actually went to bat for me. Called El Centro and said, Huggy's a lot of fun to hang out with the show, and if he's a horrible announcer, don't hire him back next year, but give him a try one time. And uh, long story short, again, is uh, I've been their announcer since 2009 at El Centro. So, and that opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, the, the Centennial Naval Aviation back in 2011, you know, I had a million people over San Diego and Broadcast Lab. I, I did that. Uh, that was uh, I'd only been announcing for two years, and that was that was a lot of work. You know, 192 aircraft flying by, and uh, you know, one, you know, one aircraft a minute for for a while, and I mean, I had to have, you know, 20, 30 seconds of notes on each aircraft as they came on by. And uh, that was a ton of work. And it was so much fun. Great history there. So early on, you're learning the backgrounds and the, uh, and, and the, the, the things that people want to hear about. And uh, one of the things I got advice on was, you know, just continue to talk like you, like, you, like you talk once you got the knowledge. So now I go up there with the notes. And I'll reference the notes. But I'll, I'll generally just kind of look at the aircraft and talk to the folks. And I'm not doing the... Oh, and now he's upside down, and now he's upside up, and now he's rolling right. I try to <laughs> try to learn when to shut up and when to we want to talk about things that, that people find interesting, and uh, it's it's worked out well. And I don't have to study as much now as I do, but I, I do I do put in prep work uh, before every show. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of prep work to do. I, I like the idea of the uh, that rendition you just did because it sounded like maybe a, a nineteen late nineteen twenties air show announcer because uh, yeah. they would have been um, uh, very excited by the idea of something going upside down and, and then right side up again. Um, you should try it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, see what the response is. Um, yeah, I want to come to the UK and announce a show over there, but uh, we'll see if I can break into that. I'm sure there'll be a ton of people here who would help you do that. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway, I interrupted you. So you do the air show announcing. Uh, do you have your own airplane? Any other flying? Any other any other hobbies? Yeah, I uh, uh, the Jet Warbird scene. Uh, I've, I've I've dabbled in that off and on. And uh, currently, there's a. Uh, are you familiar with the A thirty seven? The you know the T thirty seven is a more powerful uh, cousin. Dragonfly. Only... Right? Dragonfly. Dragonfly. Right. Dragonfly. Yeah. Yeah. You know the U.S. Air Force flew them until the early nineties. Uh, in fact, one of my pilot training classmates, uh, he actually flew them in. Panama for a year and was there when Operation Just Cause happened when they took down Noriega. He's got like ten or twenty combat stories flying the Super Tweet back in late eighty nine. Really? Yeah. Wow. And so I, I've never I've never seen anybody reference that before. Um, yeah. Has, has anybody written about that? Do you know? There's very very little about it, and, and there, there's there's an A thirty seven association. They write about mainly everything they did in Vietnam, but yeah, the A thirty seven is. Participation in um, in Panama in '89, very very little. He's not. He, there's nothing ri- written about it, and I've talked to him about it a little bit. And he's like, ah, you know, it was a great time. You know, I love flying. Love flying the airplane, but he, you know, he, he's not going to. I don't think he's going to write a book on it or anything. I, I wish he would. You have to introduce uh, him to me. I'll, I'll 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 interview him. I'd love to. Yeah, I'll see if I can do that. I'll see if, if I'll see if he's interested, and uh, I'll definitely let him know. Um, now that would be a great story actually to bring out. Uh, so, anyways, there's uh, there's an A37A that's been flying in North America, and uh, there's now there is an A37B, the, uh, um, the 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 main variant that everybody flew. And this aircraft is really cool. It's uh, I'm, I'm getting to fly it now. The owner owner has had it for 20 years. He spent 20 years uh, replacing just about everything on the aircraft, the lines, the hydraulics. Uh, he's put a it's a labor of love, but the aircraft is absolutely beautiful. I'll, I'll send you a picture after the interview. And uh, he's restored it back to the way ex- the exact paint scheme to include the blemishes and everything that were really? the way it was in Vietnam. So really? the plane was sent over to Vietnam in the late seventies. And here's the cool part: it flew for the South Vietnamese. It was delivered by Cessna and the Air Force. South Vietnam flew it for a couple thousand hours. And in 1990, when was that? 1990, I'm drawing a blank. 95, I think, when Saigon fell. The aircraft was captured by the North Vietnamese, and it then flew. They were they used it to attack the South. And he's actually got pictures of four or five pictures of the air, of the North Vietnamese uh, crews with the aircraft. They've taken the paint, they've blocked out the, the South Vietnamese markings on the tail, and they're standing around the aircraft talking or briefing or whatever. But he's got some of the pictures of you can see the tail number. It's his aircraft. But so the aircraft flew for the North in combat and the South in combat. And then after the war, the aircraft ended up going to Australia, and it sat there in pieces. And uh, back during the Clinton administration, uh, I don't know the details, but basically the uh, the administration said. Hey, you know, we 
we walk away from any, any, any equipment over their tanks, whatever, it's yours, keep it. So since that was technically, once the U.S. Uh, walked away from any right to the equipment, well, that gave Charlie, the owner of the aircraft, the ability to now buy this aircraft uh, from the Australians because now the U.S. government had, had said, no, we're not, not ours anymore. So he bought the aircraft from Australia and he spent a long time, you know, 20 years getting it restored. And uh, I've gotten to fly it a few times now. It's, it's the, the checkout process has been long and painful and I'm hoping to go fly. I haven't flown it since January with COVID going on, but uh, our, our hope is to bring that out there uh, on the air show circuit. And then that one of that aircraft's uh, stable mates from many years ago has been uh, purchased by a very good, good friend of mine. And he is restoring that aircraft and that aircraft may be up and running by the fall. So there will be two A37Bs and then the A37A, the only three flying in North America. There's a couple flying um, down uh, Buster Crab. Uh, uh, he's flying them in Australia on the air show circuit and a couple others. But this is a, it's a, it's a, it's going to be a pretty unique aircraft and we'd like to bring it out and show it around on the, on the air show circuit. So that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. And, and I, I got to tell you, it, it's not a tweet. It, it goes like a scalded cat. It is just so much power. It's a lot of fun. I love that story. That's brilliant. I, I well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm probably going to be burnt um, as a witch or something for saying this, but I, I, I dislike intensely this sort of, um, it's almost disingenuous where they talk about warbirds that are originals and all they really have is a data plate. Um, you know, I, 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 that really does my head in because as a child growing up, when people said, oh, there's an original Spitfire from World War II, I looked at it and thought, oh, yeah, the, you know, the rivets and the skin or the whole thing must be original. And um, and yeah. actually, it's just the data plate. Um, I don't know why they're allowed to say that stuff. I don't know why that qualifies it as being a warbird in that sense. Um, so, so the story of an A37 that, that is genuinely original, you know, not, notwithstanding replacing all the bits that have worn out, uh, it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah. Let's do the let's do the AMA then. So it's a it's a small uh, list of questions that uh, I, I asked okay. people to to if if they had any any sort of questions for you. The, the feedback from the first interview was really good, and I had a couple of people uh, post some questions in. And and just bearing in mind, Huggy, that you know some of these things may repeat what we've already talked about. But sure. uh, you know, so you can either reference an earlier answer, or you can give the same answer again, or you can give a different answer that relates to the uh, the first answer so this is from uh, francois avia um so he's got a couple of questions and thank you for the opportunity to ask you um the first question is would the u2 be really survivable over defended airspace like russia or china um and does it include such basic stealth technology as ram or do you just rely on very on flying very high and jamming as your defense yeah, good question, Francois. And uh, you know, a lot has changed on the U-2. Uh, first thing I'll say, the uh, RAM or the stealthiness of the aircraft, it's not there. It, it, it's, you're not going to change the basic characters of the aircraft to make it invisible to radar. Uh, there are, it is a very survivable aircraft, but there's, there's really three things we use to, uh, to remain survivable. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, we have a very, very good defensive system on the aircraft. Pound for pound, the, the experts, the weapons school folks, the contractors, the intel folks that I that know it way better than I do, when they compare it to other systems, they will tell you, yeah, it, this is a really, really, really powerful uh, defense system we have on the aircraft. So uh, we have that. And the second thing we do is uh, we fly the, you know, we know going into somewhere, uh, and let's face it, a peacetime environment, you know, we, we fly in international airspace. But, but the missile rings for a, a lot of potential adversaries do extend out into international airspace. So uh, the threat is mitigated in many ways by just we know if a missile can go to here, well, we'll fly out here. So, you know, your missile can go to 100 miles, we'll fly 110 miles away from the missile site. So knowing where they're at, and that's intel, uh, all, the, all the national intelligence that we have, we know where the sites are and we can plan tracks that, that work our way around uh, the threats. And finally, the, uh, the third thing that we use is remember, we don't necessarily operate alone. And now that we've got uh, more integration with the rest of the Air Force Back up. Think back to the U-2 in the 1950s, flying over Russia. Started in what, July 4th of 56 and ended when Powers was shot down May of 1960. Trying to go quiet, just right over the over the middle of Russia with no with no help. Well, it, it finally caught. You know, they finally they finally got caught. Um, nowadays, take the take Iraq for an exa uh, example. When I was flying missions into Iraq, uh, when co when combat was going on, I wasn't going in there alone. I was going in there with uh, maybe two four ships of Eagles. Uh, I've got F F-16s out there doing us doing SAM suppression. 
Uh, so we've got, I mean, if a radar wants to come up and take a, take a, take a paint at the U2, try to take a poke at us, they're going to they're gonna get a harm missile right down their throat. Uh, if they want to launch MiGs up and come after me, well, my, my F-15 big brother's down there, and they're just dying for somebody to come up and go, come, come threaten the U-2 because all those guys want to do is go shoot down anything. And it, was, it became kind of comical, actually, uh, in some of the briefings out there. They, they love flying with the U-2 because they knew the Iraqis wanted to shoot us down, and they were just hoping that, you know, the, I, I saw the F-15 guys just seeing throwing the U-2 out there as bait, you know, trying to they go, come get their air-to-air, air-to-air kill. And I loved it. It, it, it was great. But they, uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, and now the F-22 – and soon to be the F thirty five, but they're 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 very good at what they do, and they're not going to let us get uh, get in trouble if they've got us out there. So between those three uh, different uh, scenarios, I think we're we're uh, we're very very survivable. And certainly, we're not going to go stick a U two in somewhere if we don't think we have uh, those those things working for us. And uh, yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot of threats out there, and a lot of countries that didn't have capabilities before have them now. So uh, uh, you know, we we certainly mit- we certainly analyze the threat, and we mitigate it, and uh, then we go do our job. So yeah. Ultimately, Francois, to answer your question, yeah, we are very survivable. Uh, Francois, second question then was, um, is the U-2 still a key tool nowadays at the um, age of reconnaissance UAV, like the RQ-170? And just before I continue with the conversation, just um, the second part of our interview where I think we touch on that, I haven't published yet. So okay. we're sort of, the order of this is not quite right, but I'll ask it and you can answer sure. it anyway. So, so is it still relevant in the age of things like the RQ-170 and probably RQ-180 or whatever the official name is, he says, um, that are capable of penetrating into defended airspace and staying there for hours? So is the U-2 still a key tool against that Absolutely. backdrop? Absolutely. And, and that's, you know, that's backed up, um, it's really backed up by the, the combatant commanders when when they need intel and they want they want a platform, they're usually asking for the U two to come out there. We've got a lot of persistence. It's a big platform. We've got a lot of a lot of we generate a lot of electrical power, which means we can put a lot of very very good sensors on the aircraft. I don't know the capabilities of the aircraft you mentioned. I know nothing really nothing about them, uh, but they're much smaller aircraft, I would guess, and that's going to limit what they what they can carry, the amount of payload they can carry. And we can carry five thousand pounds of payload. Look, at, you know, it's. Um, so these other aircraft, other reconnaissance platforms, whether you're talking an RC-135 or an EP-3 or what have you, we all complement each other. We all have our different strengths and our different weaknesses, and we try to overlap that. So the RQ-170, I'm sure it's, it's, it's got its own niche that it's very, very good at. And, um, but we've got, we've, got, we've got some strengths uh, that, that uh, nobody else really has, and, and that's why the aircraft will continue. The, our reconnaissance platform, the U-2, will continue on for many, many years. Can I push you on that a little bit, Huggy? Um, yeah. Without meaning to sound rude, I mean this is the the, the balance mm-hmm. I have to strike. So, so if sure. you guys sort of overlap and you um, make sure you're complementary to one another, why do you not really know much about the RQ-170? Uh, I don't really, I don't employ with it. And let me let me back that up. Remember, I am uh, I've been out for six years. Uh, and now I am focused on teaching the basics of flying the U two. I'm not a guy who's in there teaching the, the advanced, I, I'm not even an instructor yet, technically. So I'm not going to be in there doing the, what the weapons school guy is doing and our, and our weapons officers and our, our, our tactics officers. If they're doing that, and they, very, they may very well be doing it, and they're probably, the, the new pilots are probably getting taught that. Again, compared to 10 years ago when I was somewhat relevant as, as an operational pilot flying classified missions, 10 years in the, in the, in the reconnaissance and intel world is an eternity. And a lot has changed. And when you go back in the vault, which I still don't even have access to because my clearances aren't high enough, they're talking about um, they're, they're talking about some really really interesting and cool stuff and how they are integrating. So I don't know that I don't know that we're not integrating. Again, my information dated, um, so don't uh, don't assume that because I don't know about that it, it's not happening. So Francois, uh, third and final question was then: Do you have any good sea stories or any good anecdotes about a mission or a particular flight? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different areas you could go into, uh, with that, I, you know, gave you, you know, kind of did my, embarrassed my soul with my, uh, with my really horrible landing the other day. Um, but I, I, I've got one because, you know, I like air shows, uh, and I love, I love the UK and I love flying in the UK. This kind of ties in all the aspects and, and brings in a little bit of the, the U2 secrecy, if you will, uh, into this. So this was, um, I've been, if I remember right, this was, uh, September of 1990. I only got an Alconberry in uh, March. So, you know, desert Desert Shield of the Storm is just getting ready to kick off. It was, it may have been 91, 90 or 91, doesn't matter. Um, the cold, you know, cold war is ending, walls coming down 
and um, me and another pilot, GB, we took uh, we took a U two up to uh, uh, RAF Lukers up in Scotland, uh, up near St Andrews, and uh, um, I'm sorry, I want to say uh, the, the, that wasn't GB. That was the next year. John Roush, and he's very critical to the story. John John's a legendary U two guy. About my, he was the guy that in my first interview I talked about that said, hey, you should go try the U two. He was a flying T thirty sevens at my base, and I went, you know, are we still flying those? Anyways, John John flies the jet up there. And uh, I drive the chase car nine hours up to up to Lucas. So we get there, and uh, and this is you know the red arrows are there, and the walls come down, and this is the first air show where the Russian Knights, their five ship of uh, Su twenty sevens, is going to come and do the show. And so we get to the airfield, and John lands, and uh, which was a whole story in and of itself, pretty fun. But uh, you know we're, we're walking around, and we're you know stand by the aircraft, and we're talking to people, and. Uh, and here, here comes the red arrows, you know, up in a big, big Vic right overhead, nine ship and tucked right in behind them, the SU 27s. And just, it was glorious. They break and everybody's pitching out and aircraft all over the sky. And, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's absolute air show mayhem. Everybody's screaming, having a great time, but on the ramp there, because it's such a big deal, there are, there's, there's a lot of Russian generals and senior staff out there walking around the ramp. And, uh, you know, they're out there in their big coats and their gigantic hats, you know, the big general hats they wear. And, uh, and each one of them has a, I think it's a British Army translator with them. And uh, so after everything kind of calms down, we're we're just standing around by the aircraft, and there's you know John and I, two two captains. He's you know he's a, he's a year senior to me or what have you. We're standing around, and up walks the uh, uh, one of the British or uh, one of the British translator with a, with a with a Russian general, full you know fully decked out the whole you know, whole nine yards, you know ribbons the size of Connecticut, and. Uh, and uh, we go, hey, comrade General Smirnoff would like to see the famous Lockheed U 2. Like, I look at John, he looks at me, I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah, we didn't have anything on the aircraft, we had basic aircraft and uh, parked on the ramp. And and uh, the, they brought up the lat, you know, the big platform to get up very, very easily. You know, you can easily walk up there, and it's a big platform to look in the cockpit. And so, uh, uh, and he's like, oh, oh, so he looks, oh, he's very, you know, please, he walks up the stairs when the, you know, so the, the translator goes up with him, and uh, we walk up and uh, the back and forth. Hey, comrade General would like to know if you can open the canopy and let him look inside the cockpit. Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't care. Look at John. He says, fine. So we open the canopy and he's, oh, he's very pleased with that. So he's looking inside and, uh, uh, and then uh, jo uh, John says, hey, you can tell the general if he wants to sit in the seat, you know, get in the cockpit, more than happy to let him. And he's very excited. So he, we show him and he, Kind of gets himself in and lower, you know, he's full dress uniform, gets himself in the seat and he's, he's, you know, he's talking to you, know, he's just kind of talking to the, to the uh, translator in Russian and, but these are the, and, uh, little does anybody know, but John Roush speaks fluent Russian. So John's listening to the whole thing, having a great time. And, and I guess what the general said to the translator, uh, was interesting, but the cockpit looks so much older than I expected. And then before the trans could say anything, I, I all I see all I hear is this John go, what did you do? And the general gets his look on his face, kind of anger and horror, and gets up out of the cockpit and storms down the stairs with the with the, with the general taking off after him. And John's just sitting up there kind of <laughs> he left my John, what did you do? He goes, yeah, he goes, you know, he said the cockpit looks pretty old. He goes, but, and I chimed in and I said, yes, but all the new stuff is found in the sensors that are in the pods in the back of the aircraft. And the general looked at me and he said, you speak Russian? And I said, but of course, all you two pilots speak Russian. <laughs> and so I thought we were going to start an international incident, you know, there, but uh, that was so much fun. That was 30 years ago. I remember that like it happened yesterday. He was very, very quick. He had, he had uh, his dad had worked in the embassy and he worked in the motor pool. In Moscow, and uh, you know, with all Russians, and he, he he spoke pretty fluent Russian. He was later involved in the program where he had to have an Air Force officer on all the Russian flagged aircraft going back and forth, and they, uh, so he would he would get called out to go jump on some you know, some Russian aircraft and be in the cockpit when they flew across the U.S. So, yeah, that, that is an interesting thing, actually. And maybe I'm um, you're you're not the right person for me to ask. I I um I did actually notice that on the first video that we that I put out my interview with you, BC Thomas from the SR seventy one has commented that it's a, it was a great interview. So I might have to try and get him on. But so the 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 reason I mentioned him is because the SR cockpit was classified for a long time. I think you know they retired that aeroplane before they allowed people to see what it looked like. Why do you think that the U two cockpit wasn't is not? Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean other than 
you know, sort of where the the mark number goes up to. Or, yeah, there's you know, yeah, there's not really. I mean, there's it's an F one hundred four cockpit. That's all it is. You know, uh, different ejection seat. Nineteen ninety two, we were at Aviano, and uh, this F one hundred four came taxiing an Italian F one hundred four Starfighter. I'd never seen one, you know, up close. And the pilot, you know, got out of the cockpit, and it, and he was exact everything you'd expect from an Italian fighter pilot. I mean, the, the guy just reeked of flair and you know just class and elegance and. You know, we walked, we were like, hey, can we go take a look in, in the jet? And we thought he'd say, oh, yeah, let me go show you. He's like, help yourself, you know. And so we, and he walked off. So we're like, great. So we, we ran up and we stuck our nose in the F 104. And uh, it, this is a U 2. You know, had a stick in the middle and had a, had a gun sight and a couple other things. But we were looking around going, this is a U 2 cockpit. It's a, not quite as deep and it's a little bit narrower, but uh, it's, it's a U 2 cockpit. And since then, uh, I, I know a guy in Phoenix that has an F 104, hasn't flown it in a while, but. I've gone and jumped in his. It's a two seater, and you know they got. He's got the spurs for the ejection seat, and uh, but just the cockpit layout is the same. There's, there's nothing really to see. And now with the glass, with the glass panel on the cockpit, nothing's nothing's fired up. I mean, uh, there's just nothing to see in there. It's 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 pretty basic. Hmm. They're both. You, 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 well, you got to come. You come out to California. I'll bring you out. We'll put you in the U two. Okay. I'd love to. Yeah. We'll go jump in the cockpit. Yeah, I'd love you know, to. I'll, I'll let you look around to your heart's content. Fantastic. Um. Huggy, okay, so let's let's finish the AMA then, and I'll I'll let you go because you've given me enough of your time. Um, so Kevin Ronaldson asks um, whether or not anyone's ever attempted to intercept you, um, visual and along a border, possibly. Yes, many times. Can you say more? I can't. Uh, his uh, his second question then, and it's sort of. Uh, I think along the lines of uh, the question that Francois asked is is whether or not uh, it says that given that the uh, that you've been involved in the YouTube program for so long, have you ever flown or operated with any of the RQ drones, such as Global Hawk or others? Uh, have we you said have we flown with them? Or yeah, or operated with them? Um, so I mean, Global Hawk would have been around before you retired. Uh, is that a platform that you flew with, or operated with, or coordinated with? Well, uh, you know, not we don't really coordinate directly with them, other than making sure we're not at the same altitude, and they're generally a lot lower than us, so it's not a not a pro, not a problem. So realize that the way the the architecture at least worked, it's 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 rapidly changing. Was that we're up there gathering signals of all the different kinds and imagery, and we're taking that through a data link and pumping it near real time back to a ground station. Global Hawk's doing the same thing. So maybe the same ground station or the ground stations we're talking to are, are talking to each other and the ground stations are coordinating the effort on what we're each looking at or what we're each doing using our respective strengths. But uh, ultimately, it's, we're, 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 not, we're not really talking to the Global Hawk folks. We're focused on what our intel group, um, the, the people that are directly assigned to our mission, the intel officers and the, and the people that are looking out for threats. We're focused on working with them, and then Global Hawk's got its own. So there's not a. It's not like we're going out as a two ship and, and integrating together in that particular method. Will that change in the future? I have no idea, but I wouldn't put anything beyond uh, what our weapons school guys are uh, are uh, coming up with. They're, they're 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 thinking pretty aggressively. And then Kevin's final question is: um, For how much longer do you feel that a manned platform such as the U two? And he says in. In, print, in, in brackets, uh, and I'm thinking of the mooted TRX from a few years back. So how much longer can a manned platform still carve a niche alongside unmanned programs? It, it's it'll, the sensor, It's going to be a long time, I think. Um, there is nothing quite like having, you know, a carbon-based processor, i.e. a human, sitting in that cockpit uh, and overlooking uh, the battle space. Uh, or the or the or the reconnaissance area, yeah, we've got some limitations uh, due to due to length of sortie and that sort of thing. And you know, if you can put a platform up there for sixty hours or what have you, yeah, that's going to be a there's going to be a distinct advantage there. But the manned platforms are uh, they're 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 not dead and they're not even they're not even elderly yet. They've, they've got a lot of life left in them. And then a question for me, then Huggy, and. Um... You know, I, I might, I might uh, end up cutting this out. Depends how uncomfortable you are with me asking it. I feel a bit cheeky, but I, but I do want to ask. Um, you know, I was told you had about ninety nine different types in your logbook, or 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 ninety or so. It's by the same person who told me you were the high hours guy, so it could be complete bullshit. You, you, you might only have ten or something like that. But um, are there any types in your logbook that are classified? Uh, no, but there's the ambush question at least. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's up to probably about 120 different aircraft types now. I have to go. I have to go count. Um, do I have anything classified? Um, no, I don't. Um, 
we uh I can't remember the guy's name. We had it was funny years ago at Alkenberry. We had one of the chief uh, senior senior Lockheed folks come through Alkenberry. I can't think of his name, but I knew all, he was running running. He was in Skunk Works, running everything. And we pulled him aside in the bar. We said, "We know you can't say anything, but whatever you guys are doing, we're all volunteers." You know, he just laughed and you know had a sip of his beer. And that was and nothing, nothing. Got nothing out of him. So. Uh, uh, I have no experience either on the unmanned side or the manned side with anything classified. At least, uh, I'm sure, you know, well, the U-2 was classified at one time, so uh, I, I did that, but uh, I'm sure there's a couple of others. I've, I've really had some really unique experiences uh, for flying military aircraft. I've gotten front seat rides in the, uh, the, the Super Hornet. I've flown the, the Hornet a few times, 15, 16, A4, uh, a lot of, lot of different uh, airframes on orientation flights or what have you, but uh, everything I've flown has been... Um, has either been civilian owned or a, a, a well-known military aircraft. And my final question then, Huggy, um, is there anything that you think I should have asked you about the U-2? Is there something that you know we should be talking about or should have talked about that we haven't covered? Not really. We've covered, we've covered a pretty good area. You didn't ask about the orange flight suits. Ah, orange flight suits, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, we, you know, uh, no, you, very thorough on the on the interview, and thanks for letting me just kind of talk and stream of consciousness on some of it. But going back to the uh, the '60s and '70s and '80s, uh, you saw orange flight suits in the U.S. Air Force, and the uh, the U-2 pilots and the SR-71 pilots wore orange flight suits until somebody made the decision, probably about the mid '80s, that you know, knock, knock this off. When I came to Alkenberry, when when I was there, we were the 17th Reconnaissance Wing originally, and uh, after the Gulf War, about the summer of '91. We pared down to about eight pilots, just a squadron, the 95th Recon Squadron. And so we were our own little squadron attached to Beale 4,000 miles away. So it was like, <laughs> mom and dad are 4,000 miles away. We can do whatever we want, you know? So we, uh, we kind of ran the place the way we wanted to. But we were a tenant unit on Alkenberry, and it was, it was an A-10 wing. And uh, so we decided, hey, we, we got to bring back the orange flight suits. We got to bring them back. We're just going to start doing it. So we all got our orange flight suits. And we said, starting on this day, we're going to wear them only on Fridays. And you know, and so we, on the very first Friday, you know, we, you know, we all, all wore them. And the guy I told you about, John Roush, who, who was up at the, uh, up in Scotland with the with the Russians, a couple of weeks into this, he's he's at Alkenberry on a Friday, walking through, and he comes out of the post office wearing his orange flight suit, and some A10 full bird colonel walks by, Captain, yes sir, what is up with the orange flight suit? Well, sir, you see, it's a YouTube history thing, and. Uh, we were, we're authorized the, the flight suit because of SAC regulation 453-249, humana, humana, humana. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a great, great esprit de corps. And we like bringing back the old history. And, it's, of course, it's all, all authorized completely. Oh, that's really great. Well, thank you. Carry on. We never heard anything about it after that. We were good to go. So after, after Alkenbury went away, you know, the orange flight suits were, were dead. Well, when this came back up that we were going to get hired, uh, the squadron commander of the 1st Reconnaissance Squadron, uh, Fang Collette, uh, he talked to each of the three of us and said, hey, what do you guys think, you know, be the good uniform to bring back? And uh, we talked about it. We, you know, green flight suits. We're concerned that everybody's going to think we're military and they're going to be confused. Who are these guys? And let's go with maybe tan or maybe just black uh, fitting in. Orange would be kind of cool. We, we love the orange idea. Then we thought, no, nah, let's not do the orange. We, we don't want to feel like we're trying to be those guys. So we came back and we said, you know, fam, we think we want to go with the, maybe just the black flight suits. He said, not happening. We're gonna keep. We're gonna bring back the history of the, of the orange flight suit, and good on him. And and he had actually run up the flagpole to the to the senior leadership, and they they said, yeah, we'll 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 do this. So uh, so Dean Corey and I are uh, are bringing are bring, bringing back and rocking the orange flight suits. And uh, it was a great call by Fang and the and the and the squadron folks. Uh, our concern was we're gonna show back up in the squad. And everybody's like, oh, it's the old guys, and they think they're so cool wearing their orange flight suits, but. You know, we, that was never our intent, and actually, it's been a, it's been really well received. Um, everybody likes seeing them. Uh, the novelty hasn't quite worn off just yet. It's only been about three weeks we've been wearing them, uh, and uh, it's hard to get them. I'm mm -hmm. I'm using the one I wore 30 years ago at Alkenbury because I'm having to order mine. It's it's been four weeks, and it's there. I don't know if they're sewing at one thread one thread per day, but it's taking forever. So uh, it's taking a little bit of time. But uh, and and on the big scheme, whether it's the orange flight suit or anything, I will tell you that the uh, the squadron pilots, they have been extremely receptive to having us come back. And I, I was kind of curious what, what the thought would be uh, amongst everybody, but I, I, I can't even, I can't even, uh, the, the, the level of support we've gotten from the squadron guys on welcoming us back in the squadron has just been, uh, has been wonderful. And, uh, and they love the orange flight suits. So there's the, there's the story. Well, Huggy, 
good luck in your renewed uh, relationship with yeah. you too. Thanks for coming Thank on you. the channel. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm uh, looking forward to many, many good, good years with the U2, and uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to you soon.